Welcome to Church Online. My name is Scott, and welcome to week three of our series, Dude, Be Kind. If you're here for the first time, I want to say a huge welcome, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. One of my favorite ways to connect to God is in a time of worship. So let's turn up the volume, head inside, and join the worship team. Hello, and welcome to Cape Christian. Let's stand and sing some songs together.
every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance. I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, you are my portion. You are my hiding place. Oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, I believe you are the way, and the truth, the life. Oh, I believe through every blessing, through every promise. on the horizon. Let's sing this out. It's a new horizon. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they Set on you And you meet me here today With mercies that I do Oh yeah All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay alone When I believe you are The way And the truth And the light Oh I believe
Thanks, worship team. And I hope that all of you online had fun singing along with us and had an opportunity to connect to God during that time. If you're watching this from our app or on Facebook or YouTube, we would like to invite you to the full church online experience where you can engage with our online community, share in this experience, and grow together. You can go to live.capechristian.com to create an account and find the next live event. And make sure to sign in or sign up. That way you can join the chat where hundreds of people log in each week from all over the world. And let us know how your week was and make a new online friend. Another great way to engage is to join a private chat and let us know how we can pray with you. Each week, we want you to know that no matter where you're watching from or what you may be facing, you're not facing it alone. And if you need someone to pray with you or just to talk, please click that live prayer button and one of our hosts will join you for a private prayer chat. Now, if this is your first time joining us for Church Online, I'd like to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here. And in fact, we would love the opportunity to get to know you. So right now in the chat window, we just posted a connect link just for you. Go ahead and click the link and you'll be given a digital connect card. Go ahead and fill that out and send it our way. In return, we're gonna send you some information about Cape Christian and Church Online. Thank you so much for checking us out and I really look forward to meeting you. Now we never intended Church Online to be something you just watch. Our intention is for Church Online to be a complete church experience, music, a message, and a community of people ready to share and grow together. We love introducing people to Jesus and watching them realize who He has made them to be. And we can't do it alone. We need your help introducing more people to Jesus, and that means more hosts for our service times. So if you would like to serve your church online community and give back, we would love to invite you to join the team and help host one of our online services. Thanks again, church. Now, for those of us that call Cape Christian home, this is the time you can give your tithes and offerings. If you have never given through Cape Christian, it's easy to do. Just click the Give link at the top of the page or the link in the chat window. From there, you'll be able to create an account on our secure giving platform and start giving through Cape Christian today. And when you give, you can now select Church Online Campus in the drop-down menu and give through Church Online to continue to grow and reach people all over the world. Okay, church, today, Pastor Dennis is going to round off our series, Dude, Be Kind. So let's head back inside and see what God has for us today. Well, good evening. It's great to be a part of uh, this day uh, for all of you, wherever you at. So good to see you uh, joining us in person. Uh, those of you that are online with us, uh, I get to wrap this up, and I love the fact that we started this uh, Dude Be Kind series with Pastor Corey two weeks ago, and uh, he asked if I would wrap it up. And, and so if you might be new tonight uh, or, or, or today somewhere, ever you're watching this, uh, uh, you didn't hear the rest of it. Let me just uh, talk about it. It's about more than being nice. Pastor Corey said that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he used the terminology and the little symbol of it's you over me. It's you over me. And that's an important piece of this. I lower myself to elevate you so that I can lift your load and your burden. Now, one of the other key concepts that we've been talking about over the uh, last couple weeks is the fact when given the choice between being right and being kind, we choose kind. And last week, Pastor uh, Corey talked about this whole thing of what it does in our own lives, not just in everybody else's life, but the, what kindness does for us psychologically, emotionally, relationally, how it leads to happiness in our lives, how it leads to wisdom in our lives, and how wisdom then leads to more kindness, and kindness leads to more wisdom, and that big cycle and the bottom line of it all that we started this whole series with is the further we are from kindness, the further we are from who God actually created us to be. Now, I can tell you, my 35 years here, uh, our mission at Cape Christian has always been to introduce people to Jesus and to help them discover who God made them to be. And when it comes to kindness, Jesus is the one we follow. 
His example is what we follow. So tonight, I want to take you uh, to a story that Jesus uh, tells to illustrate this whole thing of kindness. Now, nearly everyone has heard of the Good Samaritan. We have Good Samaritan laws in almost every state in America. There are these kinds of things all around the world, and it's basically the same everywhere with maybe just a slight variation, but it's basically this. If someone comes upon an emergency, someone comes uh, uh, upon an injured person or a traffic accident or whatever it might be uh, in that sort of realm, and you do your best to help that person, you do your best to render aid of some kind, you are legally protected in a court of law if something goes wrong and it doesn't turn out as you intended to turn out because you gave reasonable assistance, you won't be held liable if it doesn't turn out the way you had hoped it would. Now, most everybody's heard of that. But the reality is sometimes people don't know that uh, the name of the Good Samaritan law actually came from a story that Jesus told. And Jesus tells this story in Luke chapter 10, and I wanna read it through it tonight in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, this is the story. He says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He asked the expert in the law. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. We've all heard that before. Around here we say, love God and what? Love people. Those two things, that's where it comes from. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But it wasn't done. He wanted to know to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And here's what Jesus replied. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Now, at first glance, we can read that and simply think, hey, this guy comes uh, upon a stranger and uh, he helps a man. And a couple of other guys go by this stranger laying along the road and they don't take the time to stop and help. Now, that's just scratching the surface. The parable of the Good Samaritan Jesus told is so much more than just helping a stranger along the roadside. It's so much more than that. And so I want to spend a few minutes just pulling back the curtain a little bit to help us look into the world of the Bible to better, better understand the words of the Bible. So we have the story, uh, a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, two Jewish cities, in fairly close proximity. They're about 17 miles apart. It's like a 3,500-foot elevation drop. 
uh, through this narrow little ravine. It's often named as the Valley of the Shadow because really the sun never really shines down on the bottom of that little ravine. I've, I've seen it. I've been there. And in fact, the Psalm 23 uh, refers to the same place as the Valley of the Shadow of Death because it also had a reputation. It had a reputation where the uh, robbers would kind of hang in the cliff shadows and in the, in, in the dark and, and they would attack people walking back and forth between uh, Jericho in Jerusalem. And it's reasonable to assume, as some of the translations do, that the traveler in this story is Jewish, and he's on the way to Jericho, and we know that he's attacked, he's robbed, and he's left for dead. And we see the second part of this is that a priest sees the man lying along the road and keeps on going without stopping to help him, moving to the other side. Now, we need to know that the priest would have worked at the temple in Jerusalem, uh, so that's an important piece of this story. And next, the Levite comes along and goes to the other side of the road without helping as well. Now, the Levites at that time were, were the Jewish men who also worked at the temple in Jerusalem. They were like temple assistants. They were like facilities team, maybe working on special construction projects or, or things like that, helping out wherever they could in the temple. Now, if you're counting... There's two Jewish men, religious leaders, church people, that ignored one of their own lying along the road. And then he introduces someone else, the Samaritan. The Samaritan arrives on the scene, notices the injured man, and unlike the priest and the Levite, stops to help the man. And he uses his own resources, his oil, his wine, to treat the wound and loads him on his donkey, gets him to an inn, and pays for him a place for him to recover. Now, we would all just look at that and just say, oh, that's a pretty noble act of that Samaritan to stop along and to help that injured stranger. And in fact, if that was story happened today, it would be told on the evening news, uh, uh, this story, and it would no doubt be labeled the Good Samaritan. He stopped and he rendered aid. But there's a lot more going on here. You see, what we have to understand is the Samaritans and the Jews did not like each other at all. They hated each other. There was a lot of tension between the Jews and the Samaritans at that time, much like between the Jews and the Arabs today. And simply put, the Jews and the Samaritans really wanted nothing to do with each other. And in fact, they had spent centuries trying to be right instead of choosing to be kind. And so there's this long history that you can actually read about in the Old Testament. You see it in 1 Kings, you see it in 2 Kings, you see it again in Nehemiah, in the conflict that uh, uh, Nehemiah had with uh, Sanballat, and uh, you see it in history throughout where the Jews tried to destroy the Samaritan temple, and then there was tit for tat, and uh, there was another time in history near the time of Jesus' birth when a band of Samaritans went and desecrated the Jewish temple up in, in uh, Jerusalem during one of the Jew, uh, Jews' holiest days of Passover. And we even see it that it's alluded to and talked about in, in John chapter 4 when Jesus uh, encounters a woman by the well. There's this loathing strains between the Jews and the Samaritans. It shows up in that story as well. And uh, she's just baffled by the fact that he, a Jew, would talk to her, a Samaritan. And on top of that, in leading into that story, in that context, he challenged an age-old practice that had been going on for years and years when Jews would go from the Jerusalem area to the Galilee area, they would walk an extra 25 miles around Samaria to make sure they didn't have any opportunity to interact with a Samaritan. And so it says that Jesus needed to go through 
Samaria. He's referring to the fact that, that he was urged with the inner uh, calling of, of, of his father to go through Samaria. So you see, because the Jew, both of them and the Samaritans, both claimed to be descendants of Abraham, but they didn't follow the same laws and the same customs. The Jews looked at the Samaritans of that time as half-breeds. They had intermarried, and they had been been compromised in in their ethnicity. Uh, They they looked at them kind of as living on the other side of the the tracks, kind of a mindset. And they lived a below standard of religion because they decided to build their own temple in Samaria, and they didn't come up to Jerusalem where all good Jews should worship and, and spend the sacred uh, uh, holidays and, and, and the holy festivals and, and all of that. And so there was all of this racial, political, religious tensions, and both were intent on being right. And that was a whole lot more important than being kind. Now, we have to know those facts to understand this parable of the Good Samaritan. You see, it wasn't, you know, uh, a, a Jewish priest or a Jewish Levite that helped this injured Jewish man. It was a Samaritan. It was a man that the first century norm said shouldn't even care about an injured Jew. But he did. He did care. He did help. And in fact, at a pretty substantial uh, expense of his own because a denarii at that time was like a day's wage. So he took two days worth of his paycheck and left it with the innkeeper to cover the costs. And he said, if more's needed when I come back, I'll, I'll pay the balance. Now here's the deal. Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan is not simply about helping a stranger. It's about helping a stranger even if you do not like them. It's about helping a stranger even if it costs you something. See, Jesus is telling this parable in the context of telling this Jewish lawyer what it really means to love God and to love people. And the full significance of the parable, unfortunately, has gotten all watered down over the centuries when we use the term Good Samaritan as just rendering aid in an emergency. It's much more than that. And we have to understand that. Jesus is actually telling this parable for the shock value to the Jewish lawyer. See, the lawyer wants to limit, put a limit on kindness. It's kind of like Peter when he said to Jesus, you know, well, like how, how to put a limit on forgiveness. How many times should I go up to seven times of forgiving this guy who's done the same thing? And remember, Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And so the lawyer wants to put a limit on kindness by asking, who is my neighbor? And in fact, he's just asking the question, how far are we going to take this kindness thing anyway? And the story starts by saying he was testing Jesus. He was was trying to justify himself. So Jesus is trying to jolt this first century Morgan and Morgan with a verbal taser. (laughs) Now, we we have to know that, that every good story and every good movie, for that matter, has a hero and a villain, right? We're used to that. And in this, in this story, the Jewish lawyer is thinking this story has two heroes and a villain. In the Jewish mind of that day, it would have been, well, the priest and the temple assistant, they were the heroes. There's two of them. And the obvious villain everybody knows in that culture is that detested Samaritan. And Jesus blows the mind of this Jewish lawyer and everybody else who was listening in by revealing this huge shocker and the flip-flop of the expectation of the storyline is that these two heroes walked on by the injured. But the villain stops 
to show kindness. He's the one that lowers himself and elevates the injured Jewish man and lifts his burden by giving him a place to heal and to be cared for. And the Samaritan, the the detested Samaritan is the one who's able to rise above all the bigotry and all the prejudices that have been happening for centuries. And he shows mercy and kindness and compassion for an injured Jew. Even after that Jewish man's own pastors and church staff had passed him by. See, Jesus' whole point is is that love and kindness has no boundaries. It doesn't have any limits. And that it's powerful when unexpected. We can't pick and choose who we're going to be kind to. Here's a story that has touched my heart for the last 40 plus years since I first heard it out of my wife's childhood. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio during some of the most intense years of the civil rights movement. My parents had moved to Youngstown in 1953 to plant a church in the inner city. Our family was just one of a few white families in our neighborhood. This was my home. I did not see a difference in any of the children I played with. There was no color, just kids having fun. There was no us and them. I was them. We did life together as kids unaware of the turmoil that was occurring daily in our country. One night after coming home from the small integrated church my father started, I had gone outside to our family car to get something and I had heard someone crying out in the dark, calling my father's name. I quickly went back into the house and told my dad that someone was outside crying for help. In a few minutes, my father walked into our kitchen through the back door, assisting a distraught, muddy, black woman wearing a big fur coat and wearing lots of jewelry and carrying a suitcase. And the story soon unfolded. The woman had been abused by her husband and taking all the cash and valuables she could carry, she was leaving under the cover of darkness. Walking through the backyards of our neighborhood, she had slipped in the mud and needed help. As a five-year-old on that dark night, I witnessed an event that is forever burned into my memory. Our parents tried to send us four kids upstairs to bed, but I'm so glad we peeked around the corner. There by the kitchen table, my mother got on her knees with a towel and a pan of warm water, and she washed the cakey mud off the feet and legs of our night stranger. I'll never forget the tears streaming down the face of the unnamed woman. I can still see the police officer standing in our kitchen, not as a threat, but to assist the woman to safety. And as they were helping our night stranger to a waiting cab, she spotted an old pump organ we had in our living room. She said, wait, and she sat down on the swivel stool. And to our surprise, she began to beautifully tickle the ebonies and ivories and sang a familiar song by the great Mahalia Jackson. Bless this house, O Lord, we pray. Make it safe by night and day. She sang the complete song, then walked out to the waiting cab. We never saw our night stranger again, but as an adult, I often reflect on this event and what I saw demonstrated that night by my parents and what I learned. Kindness is lowering myself, elevating the other person and lifting their burden. Kindness usually involves a sacrifice. Kindness sees a need and attempts to meet it. Kindness has no limits. And kindness can change the world. It changed mine. And when we mix the ebonies and ivories of life together, it results in beautiful music. Yeah, it makes me emotional every time I hear that story. And I simply ask you, How will you make sure your kindness has no limits? Especially over these next weeks between Thanksgiving and New Year's, Pastor Corey has challenged us to live with kindness. 
You see, Luke wrote about Jesus asking the lawyer, he says, which of these three, in verse 36, do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer, it seems, not even wanting to to even say the name of the despicable Samaritan, he replies, the one, generically, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said at the end in verse 31 to this Jewish lawyer, be like a Samaritan. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And Pastor Corey has challenged us to this kindness Challenge to go and do likewise in these past couple of weeks. We've been challenged and reminded if each of us will just go and do likewise. Go and do likewise over the next weeks and over the next days through the end of this year. He did the math for us the last couple of weeks. If we each do two acts of kindness, it creates the potential. If we do that every day, He creates the potential to touch the lives of over 200,000 people, every person in Cape Coral, and far beyond with our online campus scattered around the entire globe. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. We're an awful lot like the priest and the Levite. And we all have our reasons why we step to the other side of the road and keep on walking. You see, the pastor and the church staff at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, they all had their reasons. Just think of all the excuses that they might have used. Well, that road's too dangerous for me to stop and help this man. It might be a decoy for an ambush. Or I've got to get to the temple. I've got to perform my responsibility on time. I've got to get home. got to see my family. Or you know... Someone really should help that guy, you know? Or maybe I'm going to the temple and and, and I can't get my clothes dirty. I can't get any blood on me. There's rules about that. Or I don't know first aid or I don't know medical training or I'm not qualified. I'm only one person. The job's too big for me. So I'll pray for him and keep on walking. Maybe even they might have thought, well, he brought it on himself. He should have never been alone on this very dangerous road. Or maybe the reason was, well, maybe he's actually dead, and if I touch him, then there's all these Jewish laws that require me to go through this lengthy hassle of cleansing rituals and all of that, and I don't have any time for all of that. You see, we never lack at finding excuses for avoiding the inconvenience of kindness toward others, do we? Now, I I know Pastor Corey would never do this. I've known him long enough to know that he wouldn't, but as the founding pastor of this church, I have a confession to make. I remember it pretty well. It's, It's been quite a while. It's when we were still meeting down at Gulf Middle School, and we used to bribe our kids on Sunday morning to help us set up because we had to, you know, set up the school. And and so we'd take them down to Finelli's Donut Shop on Del Prado. I don't know if any of you were around and remember Finelli's Donut Shop. It's where the Hooters is now on Del Prado. (laughs) But every Sunday morning before church, we had apple fritters and donuts and coffee that Mr. Finelli made, and it was Delicious. It was delightful. Our kids looked forward to it. And one Sunday, we were driving down from where we lived, up across from Cape Coral Hospital, and we were driving south on Del Prado toward uh, Finelli's, and we passed the area near the Walmart, and there was this minivan on the side of, the, uh, of Del Prado with the emergency flashers on as we went by in the early morning darkness, and we saw this couple picking up newspapers scattered down one lane of Del Prado like a couple hundred feet. And we we surmised that their 
rear door, uh, the, the, the hatch had un, 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 accidentally unlatched in some way or another. And that these newspapers were, that they were delivering to people's driveways to make some extra money for their uh, family had all fallen out on the street and been strewn down the street. So of course, we moved to the other side of the road to keep them safe, you know. And we kept on driving to the donut shop because ultimately we had to get to church on time. Now, this part's even more embarrassing. As we drove by, we realized the couple picking up the papers were not strangers. They actually attended Cape Christian. Our kids recognized them. (laughs) Now, the donut shop was still loudly calling as we debated about trying to find a place to make a U-turn and to go back and to help Pedro and Carmen. But after all, the donut shop was loudly calling and our kids needed some carbs and sugar and most importantly, we had to get to church on time. I will tell you that Carmen actually came to work at the church some years later and I did confess my sin to her and to Pedro And we confessed our sins to our kids that day. Um, And now I've made my public confession for the whole world to hear. (laughs) So who wants to be next? (laughs) But the bottom line is we never lack creativity at finding excuses. We never lack creativity at finding excuses for avoiding the inconvenience of acting kindly towards someone else. So I'm going to suggest as we go into these next days and weeks to infect our city and our world with kindness, with all of our dude be kind swag and all the rest, that we get right back to the four truths Remember the four truths that Pastor Corey started this series with? One is that kindness is learned. And we grow in it. And our kids are watching too. And kindness takes practice. And sometimes we mess it up. And kindness is most impactful when it's unexpected like Linda's mom washing the feet of their night stranger. And this one's always true. Kindness inspires more kindness. Now, the truth is you can't give away what you don't have. So I just want to say in closing, if you don't have the ultimate example of kindness, Jesus himself, in your life, it'll be nearly impossible for you to ooze with any kind of kindness over the next weeks. In fact, I had Jesus in my life and I still acted like the priest and the Levite. And sometimes I still do that 20 some years later. You see, in this Good Samaritan story, Jesus is actually the one that would rather us Understand, first of all, that we relate most closely, not to the Samaritan, but to the wounded person. And Jesus is like the Samaritan for us. He is like the one. We are the bruised. We are the broken. We are the one needing someone to lift us up and heal us from the side of the road. And when we say yes and accept his care that he's already paid the price for, He's already paid the price. He's taken care of it all. When we do that, only then are we really in a position to go and to do likewise. He calls us to go and to do likewise. So just in these closing minutes, maybe you have never chosen to follow Jesus. I would invite you to do that. You can stop at the prayer room on your way tonight before you're dismissed. Head out to the, over to the prayer room. Tell somebody. Let them pray with you. 
Most of all, we'd love to have you uh, use that 94,000 number and just put Cape Yes in there, in the text line. And we've got some helpful resources to get you started in the journey of being a follower of Jesus and saying yes to him. Most of all, I just want to pray for us as we wrap up this series and as we prepare to go on our way to extend kindness to our city and far beyond. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, I pray that as we go out and find opportunities that are always going to show up somewhere along our path. They're usually not planned for. They're oftentimes unexpected. But as those opportunities show up in our path, may we be most like you and give it the best that we can give, not the least that we can get by with. Help us to be like Jesus. Help us to go live with intentionality this week and in the weeks to follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Wow, what a powerful reminder that true kindness has no boundaries and knows no limits. And we don't get to pick and choose who we show kindness to. Church, thank you so much for joining us this series. If you joined in the middle of this series or want to go back and rewatch any of the messages, you can find the entire series along with other services on our app under Sermon Library. Today, if you decided to take that first step and give your life to Christ, I want to be the first to say congratulations. As you continue to grow in your faith and become who God has created you to be, we want you to know that we are so excited to be a part of your journey. So today, if you committed your life to Christ, we would like to send you a short video each day this next week. And these short videos are awesome resources as you continue to walk out that first week. Living for Christ is the greatest adventure of your life, and I'm so excited for what's in store. To receive these videos, just click the connect link that appears after you click the link in the chat saying you'd like to commit your life to Christ, or simply text CAPE YES to 94000. Congratulations, this truly is a special day. Now, if you'd like someone to pray with you, you can always click the live prayer button and one of our hosts will gladly join you for a private chat for a time of prayer. The chat's gonna remain open for the next few moments and if you need anything at all, just let us know. Hang out, connect, and share with others. And if you haven't downloaded the Cape Christian app yet, it's the best way to connect with us during the week and get plugged into everything that's going on here at Cape Christian. Thanks again, church. And we'll see you next week for the launch of our Christmas series, One for All. 